2,000 years ago in Israel, Jesus, God in the flesh, stepped into the waters of the Jordan River to be baptized by a man in the ultimate act of obedience and love. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, goes into the waters of the Jordan and he's baptized and he's filled with the Spirit. And for 40 days and 40 nights after that, he goes into a desolate place, a lonely place. And the enemy would come to him in his weakest moments as a man and try to destroy his purpose. But Jesus, he fought the temptation of the enemy and the weakness in his flesh with the word of God because there was something that the enemy didn't know. He is the word. He is the word of God. You see, Satan could have never imagined all that God had planned through Jesus Christ. The redemption of humanity, a savior to you and to me. So let's pray tonight that the spirit of the Lord would move in this place, set us free, and put us on a mission to our purpose. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your son. And I thank you, Jesus, that you give us, Lord, the perfect example to follow. And that you loved us so much that you came here for us out of love. Everything that you do is out of love. So, Lord, I pray that you would have your way in this place tonight. That your spirit would reign. And that there would be freedom in this house. God, have your way with us. We love you. We thank you for your sacrifice. In the name of Jesus, amen. 2,000 years ago, that happened. And Jesus' fame was growing. And the crowds were starting to follow Jesus. Huge crowds of people were starting to follow Jesus around these areas where he lived. His, his fame was increasing. And, and the people were coming because they wanted to see Jesus. This is the same Jesus that John the Baptist, when he saw him, said that this is the chosen one, the Messiah, the anointed one. This is the same Jesus that that since this time when he walked out of the desert, the desolate place, it says that he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and that he went around from place to place and town to town and he cured every sickness and every disease. This Jesus. This is the Jesus that it says that when he spoke, that he spoke of the scriptures with a supernatural wisdom, knowledge, and power and an authority that far exceeded the teachers of the law. This Jesus. That Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. In John chapter 1 it says this. In John chapter 1 it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was, was, the word was God, and the word was with God. And the word became flesh and lived among men. Jesus Christ is the word of God. Why did, could he speak with supernatural wisdom, authority, and power? Because he is the word. Every single word in this holy Bible is Jesus. Every single word. And so this is Jesus and he's on the scene and he sat down and he began to teach the crowds of people that were following him. And you got to understand, the people were anxious to hear what Jesus had to say. The people were anxious to see what Jesus would do. And everybody in the crowd had an opinion of Jesus. 
Just like you're here tonight, everybody in the crowd has an opinion of me. But everybody there had an opinion of him. Some thought he was a good man. Some thought he was a bad man. Some thought he was the savior. Some thought he was a demon. Everybody had an opinion, but the bottom line was that everybody came for the same reason. To see what he had to say and to see what he would do. And they came and and Jesus sat down and he began to teach them. And just like last week, I told you and we learned that Jesus sat down and he began to teach them by giving them a blessing. And this was significant. You know, last week as we talked through the Beatitudes and the blessings, this was the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is where where Christ started. Aren't you glad that Christ started with a blessing and not a curse? He could have sat down and said, you're all wretched sinners and you're cursed. But that's not at all what Jesus did. Jesus began with a blessing. And a blessing is significant. A blessing means that you have the love and the approval of a father. It's basically saying to you that everything that I have and everything that I own, even though you didn't earn it and you don't deserve it, it's all yours. It's all yours. You've been blessed. I'm giving it to you as a son and a daughter of Jesus, as a son and a daughter of God. It was significant. It's established from the very beginning an intimate relationship between Jesus, God in the flesh, and the people who would give their life to him, me and you. He blessed us. He didn't curse us. He blessed us from the very beginning. You see, Jesus' blessing was a hope to those people, and it's a hope to us tonight, 2,000 years later. Jesus' blessing is a hope. Jesus didn't come and say, blessed is the rich and the beautiful and the powerful and the strong. Blessed is the one who tries to be perfect, who thinks they're perfect. He didn't bless those. Jesus came and he said, blessed are the sinners who are in need of a Savior. Blessed are those who are broken and destroyed by the sin in their life. Blessed are those who would come and give their life to me. I will restore you. I'm going to redeem you. You are blessed. You see, he didn't come to bless those who thought that they had it all together. He came for you and he came for me. Those who know that they're sinners in need of a Savior. And Jesus starts this sermon with a a blessing. And his teachings were unlike anything people had ever heard. The Bible says that the the crowds that would listen to him were amazed. It means they were speechless. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. Jesus, I can be with God? A sinner? Someone who's broken, somebody who doesn't have it together, somebody that's had a hard life? I can be right in the eyes of God? They were amazed. And this is exactly what Jesus was telling them. And that's where I want to start tonight. In Matthew 5, verse 13 through 16, the very next scriptures after Jesus blesses the people, which includes you and I. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. I want to read that to you. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds And glorify your Father in heaven. Now this is great. So Jesus has just blessed us. 
That's how he starts. He starts with establishing an intimate father-son, father-daughter relationship. And the very next thing that he tells you is that you have a purpose. You weren't put on this planet by accident or mistake, and your life isn't meaningless. You have a purpose. You have a purpose. He goes on to teach his followers that as citizens in the kingdom of God, they've got divine purpose. He tells his followers, listen to this. If you go back to 13 and 14, you are, emphasis on A-R-E, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Jesus spoke of salt and light for a few reasons. Number one, these two elements were very common then and very common today. They were something that the listeners could relate to. They had a purpose. In the natural world, salt and light has a distinct purpose. And here's Jesus saying, I love you, daughter. I love you, son. And you have a distinct purpose right now on earth. Not sometime in the future. Not when you're dead. Not when you're with me in heaven. But right now, saved, set free, child of God, you have a purpose. You have a purpose, and it's right now. Today, we think of salt as nothing more than just a seasoning, right? You grab the salt shaker, you put it on whatever you're about to eat. It adds some flavor. If you're over at your grandma's house and she can't cook very good, right, it makes it actually edible. That's how we think of salt. But you need to understand something about salt in the ancient world. In the ancient world, salt was extremely valuable, all right? You walk in and go to your refrigerator now and grab whatever you want. There was no refrigeration, zero. So the way that meats and different things would be preserved is by placing salt on them. Salt preserves those things for a series of days or weeks and keeps them from rot and decay. So salt was extremely valuable. In fact, if you didn't have salt, you had a problem. It was also extremely valuable. Salt was so valuable in the ancient world that it was used to pay people's wages. Instead of you earning the American dollar, they would have paid you in salt. Salt was valuable. Salt was used as a preservative. It was very, very needed. Without it, your food would decay. It would rot. It would make you sick. You had to have it. You need to understand that salt was a necessity and it was valuable. We also need to understand that in this day and age, light wasn't like it is today. I can go over and flip the switch and we have light. But in the ancient world, that's not how it worked. If you wanted light, you had to fill a lamp with oil and you had to light the lamp. Like it was a process. And without the lamp, It was completely dark. You couldn't see how to navigate. You couldn't see in front of you. You couldn't have conversation. Like light is a necessity. It's a necessity. Without it, you can't see and you can't navigate. And just like today, light illuminates. Light illuminates. Now, there can be darkness in this room, but when I turn on a light... It's illuminated. Here's the thing that can't happen, and darkness can never overcome this light. This whole room is dark, but it can't overcome that light. And Jesus is making that point here about you and about me. Jesus was telling his followers two things. Number one, you are of extreme value to God. Did you know that? Because so many of you walk through life feeling like you're not valuable. There are students in this room tonight that feel worthless because of the lies of the enemy. You've believed lies about yourself or somebody else told you lies about yourself probably because they feel bad about themselves and you've repeated that into your mind to the point that you feel worthless. And the Lord Jesus came here tonight to tell you something. You're valuable, priceless, a necessity. You're valuable. 
The second thing that Jesus was telling his followers is that they serve an important role in the kingdom of God. When The moment you gave your life to Jesus, the very second that you placed your faith in him and you were filled with his spirit, you began to live in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. You are a citizen of an eternal kingdom that starts now, not when you die. And he's saying that right now in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven, as a citizen, you got purpose. How many of you go through day-to-day life just wondering and believing that your life is meaningless and you have nothing to offer? A lot of you. We've all been there. I've been there as, 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 as an adult. What is life about? What am I supposed to do? Why, did, why, why am I on the planet? And Jesus is answering this. Jesus is saying to you, you are valuable, a necessity. And that you have a divine purpose on this earth right now, not sometime in the future. To have a preserving impact and be a light in a world filled with darkness of sin and decay of spiritual death. Like that's the purpose. That's the purpose. I want to repeat that. Our purpose in Christ is to have a preserving impact and to be a light in an outside world of unbelievers that is filled with the darkness of sin and the decay of death, spiritual death. That's why you're here. That's the purpose. So how do we do that? Well, we do that by sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he came, he lived, he died for our sins so that we could live in eternity with him. But he didn't just do it for our sins so that we could set free. He did it so that you have purpose on earth, that you have a wonderful, joy-filled, peace-filled life on earth that brings honor and glory to him. We do it through our actions. The way that we live our life in Christ, it should look different than a dark, decaying world. The way that we live our life in school, the way that we live our life in our families, the way we live our life in church, in the youth group, it should look different than the world. We do that by loving God first and loving others. Loving God and loving others. God created you for a purpose. Your life is not meaningless. And maybe you came here tonight believing that your life is just meaningless, that you don't, you're not worthy of anything, that you don't, you don't have a purpose, that there's nothing that you can do. Who are you? Maybe you walked in with all of those questions. But your purpose is to bring glory to God. What does that mean, glory to God? It just means to bring honor to God. Our purpose is to bring honor to God. Well, how do we bring honor to God? First, we need to understand that he is the creator and we are the creation. He created us. He gave us life. It was his breath that put breath in your lungs. So he is the creator and we are the creation. The creation brings honor and glory to the creator when it does and it serves the exact purpose for which it was designed. God designed you for a purpose. God gave you talents and abilities, each one of you, that other people don't have. God gave you a testimony that other people don't have. You see, there's people in this life that you can reach that I could never reach. There's people in this life that you can reach that I can never reach because I don't have your testimony. I haven't lived your life. I haven't been through the struggles. There's talents and abilities that you came into this room with that I simply do not have. But together as the body of Christ, we can go out into this world and we can make an everlasting impact on a world filled with darkness. On a world that is searching, just like you were searching before you found Christ. A world that is searching for meaning. A world that is searching for purpose. A world that is searching for joy. A world that is searching for peace. 
You have a purpose. Your life is not meaningless. I want to let you know that the strategy of the enemy has never changed. I started this message talking about Jesus walking into the waters of the Jordan filled with the Holy Spirit going into a desolate place for the enemy to come and try to destroy his purpose. Make no mistake, the reason Satan came to Jesus in the desolate place was to destroy his purpose. The same thing he's trying to do to you today. Now we're not Jesus, but we're being transformed into the image of Jesus every day. We have the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit to resist temptation. God always gives us a way out. But the strategies never change. The strategy of the enemy is simple. And this is it. In your life, in my life, this is the strategy. The strategy is to deceive and distract you to the point where you're ineffective in the mission that God gave you. And the mission's not that complicated. The mission is, he's the creator, you're the creation. He gave you specific talents and abilities that are used to serve him. He gave you a testimony to share with others. And all he says our purpose is, is to use those talents and abilities and the power of our testimony to go be a light in the world, to be the salt of the earth. But the enemy will come to you and he will try to distract you and deceive you and keep you and make you ineffective in the mission. You see, here's the thing. If you never really know who you are in Christ Jesus and why he created you, and you never really embrace that, and you never really understand that he died for you out of love, but it wasn't just that he died for you out of love. He wanted to give you a life right now out of love. If you don't really understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you will live 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 years on this planet and never do anything for the kingdom. You will never witness or testify or share your faith with your family members who are lost out of fear. You'll never stand up in your friend group and proclaim the name of Jesus out of fear. Does it mean that you're unsaved? No. You're saved. The minute you put your faith in Jesus, you were saved. Made immortal, eternal. But see, Satan, if he can't have your salvation, he wants your effectiveness. And so he'll try to deceive you and distract you and make you ineffective. And you won't witness or testify to your family or your friends. You won't use those talents and abilities that he gave you to glorify him. Because you've been deceived and you've been distracted from the purpose. You see, that is what Jesus is saying. When he makes these safe statements, if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be salty again? Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Who would light a lamp for light and then cover up the light? But we do that every day. Don't we? Don't we? Can we be honest? Do we light the lamp and put it under a bowl? We do. Like the light of the world, Jesus lives in us, and out of fear, we won't even acknowledge that we have faith in him in our school or our friend group, out of fear. This is what Jesus is saying. That the enemy wants to make you ineffective. And if you lose sight of who you are in Christ, which is saved, set free, a child of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the grave lives in you. But if you lose sight of that, and you lose sight of the purpose that he created you for, you'll live a life that is ineffective in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and the advancement of the kingdom of heaven on earth. Let me leave a question with you. 
Are you okay with your family members who don't know Jesus going to hell? Are you okay with your friends who don't know Jesus dying and being separated from God for all of eternity? Are you okay with that? You got to wrestle with that. Because every day that we don't show our family and friends and the people that God puts in front of us the love of Christ through sharing our testimony, a hug, a prayer, saying God loves you, inviting them to church, sharing a message, sharing a scripture. Every day that we don't do that, what we're essentially saying is I'm okay with the people you've put in front of me being separated from God for all of eternity. I'm not okay with that. We can't be okay with that. We're the light of the world. You see, God says you were created and made new, and you were made for a purpose. When we put our faith in Jesus, we came to life. We were made a new creation, baptized in him, filled with his spirit, made immortal to live in eternity in the very presence of God. Our sins forgiven, no longer accountable, filled with joy, filled with peace, filled with the knowledge, filled with the, the same spirit that says it will teach us all things, it will lead us, it will guide us. When we put our faith in him, we received all of those things. And that's who you are in Christ. But the enemy sneaks up on you and says, well, what do you have to offer? <laughs> like, really? <laughs> what are you going to do? How are you going to be effective? You can't even make up the bed. What are you going to do? That's the questions he'll put in your head. He'll say things like, so hold on, let me get this right. This is how Satan talks to you in your head. L let me get this right. So you, you, you're going to lead somebody to Jesus when you're so broken and you're so in sin and you're so screwed up. Good luck. That's what he says to you. But Christ says, you've already been forgiven of your sin. You're already set free. I don't demand perfection. I look for faith. Day by day. You'll be transformed in my image. If you love me, you will obey me. And as you obey me and you get to know me, you're going to be transformed. Your mind's going to be renewed. Listen. Listen to God. Believe God. Don't believe these lies of the enemy that want to make you ineffective. Listen to God. Worship team, y'all can join me. I got to read you something as the, the team comes up. I got to go back to verse 13 and 14. Verse 13, you are, you are the salt of the earth. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. You are. Now, I want to read you something. John 8, 12. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world. I want to read you Ephesians 5, 8. Ephesians 5, 8. For you were once in darkness... But now you are light in the Lord. Here's been my prayer all week. That you would wrap your head around this right here. This is it. This is the takeaway. This has been my prayer for you. For you to understand that when you believe that God put his Holy Spirit in you. And that Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. 
Jesus, who said, I am the light of the world. He lives in you. He lives in you. He said, you are the light. You are the salt. You see, we can't do this on our own. But we can do this with the power of the Holy Spirit when our lives are led by the Holy Spirit. And that Spirit lives in you. How would things change if you really believed that you are? I believe what's holding us back. I believe what's holding you back as a generation from going out and it being a revolution, literally a Jesus revolution, is that you don't believe that you are. You believe that you need to be some better version of you. And it's a lie. You don't need to be a better version of you. Christ already died for you. He already set you free. He already gave you salvation. He's already transforming you into the image of himself. He's already at the right hand of the Father pleading for you in prayer all day, every day. That he loves you. As a father loves a son and a daughter. You are. But I believe so many of us in this room and so many Christians throughout the world, we just take our light and we put it under a lamp because we don't believe that we are. We believe that we've got to be some better version well, you know, if I can overcome this sin in my life, then I'd be able to actually do something for God. Lie. You know, if, if I were just more popular, if I were just more attractive, if I just had more friends, all lies. You are the light of the world. You're forgiven. You're set free. And you're being transformed. What if you stopped focusing so much on your struggles? What if you, what if you stopped focusing on the sin that's in your life? What if you stopped focusing on your fears? And you started focusing on a walk with Jesus. You started focusing on intimacy and prayer. You started focusing on what God really has to say about you in this world. Word. If that was our focus, then all the other things would be void. There's a reason that Christ said, I am the light, and you are the light. Practically in our life, right now, tonight, tomorrow, what this looks like for you tomorrow is praying things like, God, Spirit, I don't want to cuss. Like, I'm just doing it to try to look cool. Spirit, help me. I'm weak. Help me to make the things that come out of my mouth beneficial to other people. Holy Spirit, I know I got this friend and I know that he or she is hurting. But I'm just too scared to ask them, to, can I pray for them? Holy Spirit, give me courage. Give me courage to walk up to that person and just say, I want to pray for you. Holy 
Spirit, I want to know you better. Put in my heart to get to know you in this word. Holy Spirit, I'm so afraid of people thinking I'm weird because of you. But my friends don't know you. And they're lost. And I'm just sitting by doing nothing. Yeah, I have you. But I'm watching my family and my friends be destroyed. God, I've been so, I've been so scared to invite them to church. (laughs) Holy Spirit, help me. Give me courage and help me to just invite them, to share a message, to share scripture. Maybe all I... Maybe all I need to just tell them is Jesus loves them. I think so many times we think we have to go do these big things for God. But the truth is that the way people are going to experience Christ in your life is little things. It's just little things. It's the hug, it's the prayer. It's the invitation. It's the encouragement. It's being different even when different isn't cool. And when people tease you about it and ask you about it, for you to have the courage to say, that's not the life that I want. I've been made for a purpose. I serve a king and I have a father in heaven who loves me and I want to show the world how much I love him you see that's it how could we right here in this room change the world around us if we really believe that tonight What kind of impact would we make for the kingdom of God if we really believe that tonight? And that we walked out of these doors tonight transformed on mission. On mission.